Keanu Reeves has made a household name for himself. In the 90s, he was the star of such classics as Speed, Point Break, the movie that changed sci-fi action forever, The Matrix, and Bram Stoker's Dracula. Okay, so he wasn't the best part of that movie. I know where the bastard sleeps. I brought him there. Let's move along. In mid-2010s, he reinvented himself as John Wick in the John Wick franchise. To this day, he's kicking ass, taking names, and getting us audience members to flock to the theater and watch whatever he puts out. As someone who grew up in the 90s, I would watch all of his films. Two of them would stand out to me though, before The Matrix came out. The first and obvious choice was Speed. The other was Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, a film that has stood the test of time. So let's try to guess what number I'm thinking of. 69, dudes! Hit up the local Circle K and find out. When did the Mongols rule China? I don't know, I just work here. On this episode of Revisited. <laughs> Let's go back to the 80s, 1987 to be exact. Ed Solomon and Chris Matheson, who would write the screenplay, were roommates at UCLA and shared a passion for comedy and science fiction. They were driving around Los Angeles one night and were discussing time travel and the potential it could have to be funny and began writing. The two were inspired by Southern California's slacker archetype. They wanted to create a funny story that was centered around two likable yet brain-dead characters who would go on time-traveling adventures meeting historical figures along the way. The original the original title of the film was Bill and Ted's Time Van. Yeesh. Its original concept was similar to the film we have all come to know and love, except they borrowed a van from their friend Rufus and somehow ended up in Nazi Germany. After some hijinks, they would bring back Adolf Hitler to present day San Dimas before collecting other figures. Ed Solomon would go on to say that was problematic, obviously, and Hitler was switched out with Napoleon. I'm glad he's the one who ends up becoming the Ziggy Piggy. Ziggy Piggy, Ziggy Piggy. <laughs> After finally refining the concept and fleshing out the characters, they came up with Bill S. Preston, Esquire! And I'm Ted Theodore Logan! Yeah! And added more elements of humor and satire. The van would be abandoned because the film came off like a wannabe Back to the Future. It would be replaced with a phone booth, which wasn't intended to reference as a part is from the popular British sci-fi show, Doctor Who. The project would catch the attention of Nelson Entertainment, which was a production company known for its classic 80s and 90s films, such as City Slickers, Lord of the Flies, and When Harry Met Sally. The film was greenlit with Stephen Herrick, who had previously directed Critters at the helm as director. If I should fail to keep these two on the correct path, the basis of our society will be in danger. Don't worry. It'll all make sense. When it came time for casting Bill and Ted, Herrick would screen between 200 to 300 actors for the role. Most notably, Pauly Shore and Gary Riley were in the running for Ted, while River Phoenix, Matt Adler, Sean Penn, and Brendan Fraser had auditioned for Bill. Keanu was one of the first to audition for the role, and Herrick instantly identified him as Ted. Do you know when the Mongols ruled China? 24 actors were then in the running to act alongside Keanu, including Alex Winter. Dust, win. On the day of callbacks, Alex would wait with Keanu and the two began to talk and they realized they both had a lot of personal interests in common. During this time, they developed a rapport between each other during auditions and Alex would be hired as Bill. During rehearsals, the two would work on developing their characters from just the typical slacker to insert sincerity and other more human elements into them. The pair would create their own mannerisms, but still kept to the dialogue written by Solomon and Matheson. Alex Winter would base Bill on the looks and trends he would see along Venice Beach, California, where he was living at the time. We are in danger of flunking most heinously tomorrow, Ted. The biggest happy accident was casting George Carlin as Rufus. Herrick stated their intention was to have Eddie Van Halen as Rufus. Unfortunately, this wasn't possible because of the low budget of the film. Rufus's audition had a short list of actors, including Ringo Starr, Roger Daltrey, Sean Connery, and Charlie Sheen. They soon realized that not one of these people on the list was a comedian. Producers Scott Kroof and Bob Cord had just finished filming Outrageous Fortune, which co-starred Mr. Carlin. And with the film's production nearly complete, they were able to get him to film on Bill and Ted. We got 10 hours left. Mm -hmm. You got two hours. Huh? Ted, you forgot to wind your watch again. 
when Bill and Ted go to the future and meet the three most important people, they were originally supposed to be portrayed by the band members of ZZ Top. Solomon had connections to the E Street Band, the Tubes, and the Motels. They were able to secure Clarence Clemens, Fee Waybill, and Martha Davis. Solomon and Matheson even appear in the film's ice cream scene, who give Napoleon the Ziggy Piggy pin. Ziggy Piggy! Ziggy Piggy! <laughs> Production commenced on April 28, 1987, with a budget of $8.5 million. Filming took place over a period of 10 weeks in both Phoenix and Tempe, Arizona, as well as two weeks of shooting in Italy. When we follow Napoleon to the water park entitled Waterloo, the filmmakers would use a combination of establishing shots at Raging Waters in San Dimas and shots with the actors of Golfland Sunsplash in Mesa, Arizona. Unfortunately, there is no Waterloo water park. Because of their limited budget, it, they could not close down the water parks for filming. So in each of those shots, those were real paying customers. The mall, which becomes the center story to the climax, was called the Phoenix Metro Center and would unfortunately close on June 30th, 2020, most likely due to the pandemic. You are such a key. <laughs> Way to go, Egghead. Geek. <laughs> what is a geek? The film also employs some good old 1980s CGI. It's most apparent when Bill, Ted, and the historical figures are all traveling through the circuits of time. The VFX was created by Perpetual Motion Pictures. Alex Winter recalls the filming for these scenes were difficult because in order to come up with the desired effects, multiple people would need to stand inside the booth, which was positioned on a gimbal in front of a green screen. Unfortunately, numerous equipment and prop failures ensued. Keanu even said it was a death ride canoe from the worst first carny ride you've ever been on. Bill? I think I got an idea what's wrong. What? The antenna's broken. So let's talk about the plot. It follows our two good-natured but academically challenged high school friends. It's Napoleon. The short dead dude from our history review. They are on the verge of failing their history class, jeopardizing their dreams of becoming successful rock musicians. A time-traveling guide from the future, Rufus, finds them at a Circle K and lends them a phone booth that allows them to journey through time to gather historical figures for their history presentation. As they venture through various periods in history, they encounter iconic figures like Socrates, Joan of Arc, Napoleon Bonaparte, and more, leading to hilarious and often chaotic interactions between these historical figures and the modern world of the 1980s. Of course, Bill and Ted pull off the greatest history report of all time, not only saving their grades, but being one step closer to bringing wild stallions to life. In the end, Bill and Ted not only learn about history, but also discover the true essence of friendship and the importance of Be excellent to each other. Post-production began in May 1987 and lasted a full two months. The initial cut of the film was two hours and 25 minutes. What? How? It would be scaled down though to a crisp 90 minutes, which is how long every film should be these days. I'm looking at you, Oppenheimer. Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure was planned for a 1988 release because filming and production were completed on schedule. Sadly, the original film distributor, DEG, would fall into significant debt in late 1987 and filed for bankruptcy the next year. Since the film was in post-production, Herrick attempted to show the rough cut to other distributors. Test audiences were pulled from local malls and would see this cut. They'd have an extremely positive reaction. This would lead to a small bidding war from production companies to get the title. Former DEG executives did end up at Nelson Entertainment, and along with Orion Pictures, they were able to secure new distribution rights for the film in 1988, costing $1 million. Why don't you guys take a dinner break? This excellent adventure would release theatrically on February 17, 1989, and would go on to gross $40.4 million domestically. Both critics and audiences were favorable of the slacker duo. Critics appreciated the film's positive and optimistic themes, promoting friendship, tolerance, and the idea of being excellent to each other. 
It currently holds an 82% on Rotten Tomatoes, with the consensus being Keanu Reeves and Alex Winter are just charming, goofy, and silly enough to make this fluffy time travel adventure work. The chemistry between the lead actors and the amusing portrayal of historical figures were frequently praised as well. People loved the time traveling premise, blending historical characters with the modern world, and that it was a fun and inventive concept. Many reviews noted that Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure was an enjoyable and unpretentious comedy that would cater to a young audience while providing enough wit and charm for older viewers. <laughs> Because of the film's popularity, it spawned two sequels, a breakfast cereal, an animated series which would feature Winter, Reeves, and Carlin's voices, a live action series that wouldn't showcase our actors, comic series, toys, and video games. But the biggest and most memorable to me was the yearly Halloween Horror Nights event at Universal Studios Orlando and Hollywood, entitled Bill and Ted's Excellent Halloween Adventure. It ran from 1992 all the way up to 2017. In the show, Bill and Ted would popular pop culture of that year and they would get into some scheme fighting villains who would steal the phone booth. Every year the show would be different, but what wouldn't change is the charm. It would include some incredible dance numbers, stunts, and multiple double entendres for its adoring crowd. I was devastated when I heard that 2017 would be its final year running. Every year that I would attend Halloween Horror Nights, this was a staple and tradition of mine to do. It has since been replaced with a show that is similar in regards to dance numbers and stunts, but has been stripped of any theming other than to get hundreds of theme park patrons out of the humid central Florida air. It's wonderful to report that this film didn't just get a small cult following upon its release. No, this is a movie that has been beloved since its initial release. I will say there is a handful of people that consider the sequel, Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey, to be the better film, myself included. There is no denying the sheer joy that this movie evokes in people. In conclusion, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure is a joyously fun and entertaining film all around. Its characters are beloved, the soundtrack has pure 80s rock oozing out of it, and it's a feel-good comedy with some unexpected depth. One, two, one, two, three, four! <laughs> Do get better. <laughs>